Joy is a choice. Do you want more joy in your life? Well, stay tuned because we're going to talk about joy today. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Come right back. Joy is a choice. Some of you may think, ah, that's not really true because I've gone through a lot of problems. I've gone through trials and tribulations. Well, we're going to look at scripture and see who else went through trials and tribulations and how they chose joy. How many times have we gone through trials and tribulations? I know I could write a book on them. I've been there. But I can remember in the midst of my trials and tribulations and in my darkest hour, I would call upon the Lord and say, God, you are my strength. If we put our strength and our trust in the Lord, we know God is working all things out for our good. Now, if you're not putting your trust in the Lord and your trust is in the world and you're doing things on your own strength, then you're going to be downcast and depressed. Now, I have certainly felt depression. I think it's a human emotion that all of us have felt. But I've also learned the key to contentment. I've learned the key to joy. And so I want to share with you today how scripture views joy, how the disciples saw joy. What did Jesus say about joy? So let's start out by looking, what, what did David say? What did the Old Testament say? David said this, he said, Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the lyre, Oh God, my God. David said he's going to praise the Lord in the book of Psalms. When you get downcast and you feel some kind of depression come over you, the key to overcoming that is start praising the Lord. Start being grateful. Start thanking him. Start saying, oh God, I praise you like David did here. God, you are my joy and my delight. Now, you may not feel that immediately in your spirit, but when you start saying it over and over again and you embrace God's joy and you say, God, you are my joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. It's going to change your countenance. You're going to embrace that joy because if we have eternity in heaven, then how can we be depressed? This life is like a vapor, scripture says. We're only here for a very short period of time. And I understand we can have all kinds of things fall apart. In fact, right before we aired this, I was, I was saying I've got my car in the shop. for I, A deer hit me, then I hit a concrete block at the gas station. So my car's in the shop. Just yesterday, we had a leak in a shower in our basement in our new house. And so they had to come and cut a fourth of my daughter's entire one wall out and some of my uh, hallway is all cut out. There's, there were fans running everywhere. I had to turn off right before we filmed. And so, you know, it seems like you've got this going on and that going on. And I could name a whole lot of other things besides my car and our house being cut into. And you might be thinking, well, that's nothing. I have, maybe you're facing, uh, you know, a death in the family. And, and there is a time of, of mourning according to Ecclesiastes 3. But we also know that after that time, then there's joy and we can keep our joy in the Lord because even those that go on to be in heaven, we know we're going to see them someday. And that is good news. Someday I'm going to see my dad in heaven. Someday you're going to see that loved one in heaven. And so the joy of the Lord is my strength. I'm looking forward to my future. I'm looking forward to that eternity. Nehemiah said this, he said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. He was saying this to the remnant of Israel. He was telling them the joy of the Lord is your strength. He was telling them that you may have had sorrow, you may have had weeping, 
And you may have known God's law at one time and followed it, but they'd gone far away from God. The Israelites, the remnants, had gone far away from the Lord. And so the book of Nehemiah is about rebuilding the city. And Ezra is talking about that. He's talking about, we're going to rebuild the city and it's time to rebuild your life. Ezra was encouraging them to turn back to God. He let them know that the reason why they were downcast, the reason why they were so depressed, was because they had turned their backs on God. Not everything is God's fault. There's an enemy lurking around seeking whom he can destroy at all times. But sometimes God allows us to go through trials and tribulations to get our attention. And sometimes I've had people ask me, how do we know if it's God allowing this or if Satan is doing it? And my response to that is, it really doesn't matter because if my core is, is my joy is in the Lord and I keep my eyes focused on the Lord, whether it's God allowing it or Satan trying to kill, steal, and destroy, my eyes and my heart is centered right on the Lord. And so that's what Ezra is trying to tell them. He's saying, rebuild your heart, rebuild your mind, rebuild your city, and rebuild everything with your eyes focused on the Lord. And when your eyes are focused on the Lord, you're going to experience joy. David spoke about joy after committing a great sin. Some people get into so much condemnation, they think God will never forgive them. Who has not sinned? Everyone has sinned. Everyone has fallen short. Now, I don't need a list of your sins and you don't need a list of mine because when we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins, he says he not only forgives us, but he forgets about it and wipes it away. So we don't need a recollection of all those sins. But you know what David said after he'd committed adultery and he, he was in great sin. David had fallen and David knew God. David knew better. He knew when he was committing the sin that he shouldn't have done it. And then to hide his sin, he had the woman he had the adulterous affair with, he had her husband on the front lines of battle so he would die. So basically he became an adulterer and a murderer all at the same time. And David knew that condemnation that can overtake a heart. You've gone in sin and you've disobeyed the Lord. And so we see David speak about joy because David wanted that to be wiped away. He wanted to get his life right with God. And he says this, he says, God created me a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take away your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. I love that David spoke of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. There was a spirit of God that was already on the earth. God created the earth. He created mankind. And so his spirit was in the earth. David knew what it was like to be close to God's heart. He also knew what it was like to turn away from God and, and turn his back on God and be involved in sin. You know, pleasure is good for a season, right? But then the condemnation and the rawness of that sin will come to your heart. The Holy Spirit that he speaks of will remind you of what you've done. The good news is when you ask Jesus to forgive you, he forgives you. And that's why Jesus died on a cross. He died for sinners. But David is saying, not only do I want forgiveness, God, but I want you to fill me with your joy again because he didn't want to live in condemnation. I mean, he had a man die, right? That person was gone forever. But you know, God, his heart is merciful and graceful to you and to me. He forgave David. And not only did he forgive him, he blessed him and he loved him. And later on, he says about David, that is a man after my own heart. How could God say that about a sinner? That's what God says about us. He says, you are a person, when you turn to God with all your heart, he says, that is a person after my own heart. We can rejoice over God's universal reign. There's another thing to be joyful about. God is ruling and reigning in the world. Clap your hands, all you nations, and shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. God rules and he reigns. 
That is something to shout for joy about. And you might think, well, I'm not seeing it in my workplace. Guess what? If the Lord God is in your heart, he's ruling and reigning through you in that workplace. Don't allow the world to overtake you. You overtake the world with the goodness of God. I think you need to shout for joy. It's time to get joyful. And I just want to take a moment and thank you, partners, that has helped me take the gospel around the world. We just opened up to the Caribbean, and so I want to put that out there. Thank you for helping us to expand. Uh, we're, we're sharing the good news, and so I'm grateful for your help. And I want to also share the oil of gladness. Do you have an oil of gladness? It says, And those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. You know, there is joy to be yours. Have you ever been around a person or people who are depressed? I think of Job in the Old Testament. Job had some friends that were kind of depressing, you know, called Job's friends. You can read about that in the book of Job. And I mean, and his wife, I mean, his wife told Job, you know, why don't you curse God and, you know, and die? I mean, Job was surrounded by negativity, but Job made a choice. In the midst of his trials, in the midst of his tribulations, in the midst of calamity, in the midst of losing everything, joy was in his heart because his heart was centered on the God. You see, when your heart is focused on the Lord, you're going to have joy. Everlasting covenant of his grace. The everlasting covenant is something to be joyful about. The everlasting righteousness of salvation the everlasting love God has for us, the everlasting communion with Jesus. That's something to shout and be joyful about. And you know, we have the gospel. Can you imagine if we didn't have all these scriptures to put in our hearts? Praise God, we can have joy that we have his word. Jesus said the key to remain in joy is to remain in his love. In John chapter 15, he talks about this. Jesus said this. He said, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. He gives us a key right there. If you want joy, remain in love. You might be thinking, how can I remain in love with this person over here that is really hurting me or upsetting me? Well, maybe you need to pivot. Maybe you need to pivot and say, you know what? Sometimes, I, I'm just saying, sometimes there are boundaries. Henry Cloud's book on boundaries is one of the best books I've ever read. Sometimes you've got to have some boundaries with Job's friends, right? Some of those people. But listen. When the joy of the Lord is your strength, what if you interject joy into those people? What if you're the joy? What if you don't allow the negativity to overtake you, but you infuse them with joy? I have learned, God has put me through training on this. I, I should write a boot camp on this because I have been around a certain person in my life that has, every time I'm around them, tries to provoke me into getting upset or provoke me into being depressed. Well, I pivoted. I pivoted around that. I don't respond to that person. I don't allow that person to control me. Instead, I infuse joy. When, when negativity comes towards you, let it bounce right off of you. Just don't even really give it a lot of thought. Don't even talk about it and give it any kind of premise in your life. Just start thinking, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength and interject them with joy. I know that's easier said than done, but try it. Interject people with joy. Jesus said, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. 
You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. You see, Jesus says it right there. He says, I want you to go bear fruit. How are you going to bear fruit? Interject people with love. Have the joy of the Lord. You've got to have joy in order to have love. They kind of go together. If you're, if you're just all mean, sad, and depressed, how are you going to interject joy and love into people's lives? Joy of the Lord is your strength. Your grief will turn to joy. Just before Jesus was going to go to the cross, God had let him know it was about that time. And he knew that the disciples he'd been with for three years were going to probably feel pain from that because Jesus, he walked and talked with these disciples for so long. The disciples were used to Jesus being with them. He was, you know, he was going around healing people. He was loving people. He was leading people to salvation. And so the disciples were his best friend. They were there together, constantly traveling together for three years. And a time was going to come when Jesus was going to die. And Jesus knew that. And so he started preparing them. He started preparing the disciples to let them know that their joy is not in this world their joy is in the Lord. And the, their joy needs to be to look at, to look at the future, to look at eternity. And so Jesus starts prepping them to not have big grief over him dying. And he says this right before the Lord's Supper. He says this, In a little while you will see me no more. And then after a little while you will see me. At this some of the disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. And because I am going to the Father, they kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? He said, very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice. And no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Jesus was letting him know before he was getting ready to die. He said, ask the Lord to give you joy, and your joy will be complete. This is how he ends that about this, these scriptures. He says, Ask and the Lord will give you. You want joy? Ask the Lord. Like Jesus said, and God's going to give it to you. Jesus knew the persecution ahead for himself and for the disciples. And so he prayed to God in this prayer for their joy. He said this. He says, I am coming to you now, God. He's praying this. But I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Jesus was trying to help them receive his full joy within them. He was praying also not just for the disciples to have full joy within them, but for all of us believers in him to have full joy. Trials can be the, the variable that keeps us from joy, right? So we see James, the brother of Jesus. There's two James in the New Testament. There's James the apostle that went with Jesus everywhere, and there's James that's Jesus' brother. Well, just like any normal sibling would act, James, Jesus' brother, didn't really follow Jesus when he was on earth. I mean, he, he was a brother, so like a sibling would be. He didn't really follow him, but you know what? 
James saw the resurrection. He saw the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And after all of the years James spent with his brother, and after seeing what he went through at the end of his life, it did something to James. He became a believer. And not only did he become a believer in Jesus being the Son of God, but then he wrote down things about Jesus, and he wrote the book of James. And so James says this. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Now, I just want to, I want to say this. They're being persecuted at this time. Jesus had died, and Christians were being persecuted. So James is trying to tell everyone. He says, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking. Scripture tells us that James at one point wasn't a believer, but then he turned and became a believer, and James understood the principle I'm telling you. The joy of the Lord can be your strength. The joy of the Lord can enter your heart. It's a choice. Even in the midst of your trials, it's a choice. James was full of joy. He had the true joy that we all can have. Receive that joy today in your life. Peter was full of joy. Peter, one of the disciples, he went through a lot. You know, he was the one that denied Jesus three times. I mean, Peter, if you follow his, his character throughout the Bible, I mean, he, he was kind of restless in his spirit at times, and he said what he thought. I love Peter. I'm probably a little bit like Peter out of all the disciples. I don't know if I should admit that, but Peter, I just love him because he said what he thought. And, and he had a way of kind of protecting Jesus at times. And he didn't always maybe do things the right way. Of course, he didn't do the thing right way whenever he denied Jesus three times. But you know what? Jesus didn't let it in there. Jesus knew that that could possibly steal Peter's joy whenever he was going to die. And so just like Jesus does with his grace and mercy, he speaks life into Peter like he speaks life into you. He spoke life into Peter and he didn't look at Peter from his past. He looked at Peter for his future. Jesus doesn't look at our past and say, oh, you've done this, this, and this, so you can't be used for my kingdom. No. Jesus says, look to the future. Look for tomorrow. Look what I can do in your life. And he tells Peter, on this rock, you're going to build my church. And he, he positions Peter now to be a rock. And so God is positioning you to allow his joy to completely fill you. It's not what you did yesterday. It's not what you did in your past. It's what are you going to do right now? What are you going to do at this moment going forward? Is the joy of the Lord going to be your choice? Is joy going to be your strength? Look to the future. Peter said this, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And if you remember, Peter was known to be crucified like Jesus, but he didn't want to be on the cross like Jesus. He wanted to be crucified upside down. That is believed to be the tradition of Peter that was written about in history. Joy in Jesus. Paul shared that God is working all things out for your good. He says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. Paul also said, my brothers and sisters rejoice in the Lord. He was reminding them this over and over again in the churches. He was telling the people, have your joy in the Lord because he knew they were facing trials and tribulations. Paul said this, he said, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. So I want to leave you with that. Rejoice in the Lord. When you start facing trials and tribulations, start rejoicing and praising the Lord. It may say, seem counterintuitive, but do it anyway. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that every person listening will accept your joy, that their joy of the Lord will be their strength. And Father, I pray anyone listening that has not received you will receive you into their heart right now today. I pray this in Jesus' name. God bless you. Remember, with God, all things are possible. His joy is for you. Receive it today.
Thank you for having me into your home. I'm so excited about this beautiful mug that has scripture on it that I believe you can start your day off right with. Every day you can wake up and have a cup of coffee or like me, have a cup of tea. And you can celebrate the goodness of God in your life and look at the scripture that says on the cup that says, the Lord is my high ridge, my stronghold, my deliverer. My God is my summit from Psalm chapter 18, verse two. God is our high ridge and our summit. You know, we need to let go and let God. And sometimes in the morning, we need to be reminded of that. And so we want to get this mug to you. It's this beautiful red and black and white color. I think of the color red. It reminds me of Jesus shedding his blood for us. I, I think of the woman at the well. I think of the woman hemorrhaged with blood. I think of all kinds of things in scripture. And so ladies, I know this would be special to you as you're at home with your children in the morning before they get up. I believe if you start your day off in the Lord fellowshipping with him, it's going to be a good day. This is special for you. We've gotten these for a short period of time. With your $15 donation to the ministry, you're going to get this wonderful mug. I want to add another additional thing to go into your marriage. I have a wonderful marriage booklet called Love the Most. If you want something to empower your marriage, then for a $20 donation, you're going to get the booklet for your marriage and the coffee mug. We also have a special opportunity, ladies, for you, my sisters in the Lord. I just did a four-part teaching series on women in the Bible called God is with her, she will not fail. If you get this set, you're going to get a bonus teaching, a 32 minute bonus teaching on many more women that no one else will get. This is going to be exclusive of this DVD package. They're only $30 and that $30 will help us take the gospel around the world. With your $50 donation to the ministry, you're going to get a three piece set. You're going to get the DVDs with the extra bonus. You're going to get the marriage booklet and the mug. Ladies, I am here to empower, encourage, and help everything in your life to draw closer to the Lord. I want to empower you with the Word of God. That is the key to unlock enrichment in your life. There's two ways, ladies, you can get these gifts. You can go to the phone, go to 417-598-2575, you can call and order it there, or ladies, you can go to the website, go to drmarla.org, and you can order it online. Remember, with God, all things are possible. Keep seeking Him. Keep loving Him. Get these things for you today or for a friend. Go to 417-598-2577, or go to the website, go to drmarla.org. God bless you and remember with God, all things are possible for you.